Thank you. Uh, I'm one of those people who's defined by what they were, where they've been. <laughs> I always tell people I've retired three times. I'm very retiring. <laughs> and I'm working on my fourth retirement. Uh, uh, when I re left uh, Berkeley, many of my colleagues didn't really understand, you know, how could one leave Berkeley? They thought this was uh, heaven on earth, right? And I tried to explain it. I never could quite convince them. So finally, I told them in words that they understood. I said, I'm going to Taiwan into the family business. <laughs> and that they understood. <laughs> so um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, climate change. And uh, this is kind of a grim topic, usually. So I don't want it to be too grim to uh, upsetting. But you know, as uh, President uh, <coughs> always said, uh, climate change is here. And in California, we see it in most dramatic ways in uh, terms of uh, fires that come every summer and uh, stay for much longer than they do. This is uh, one last year, went to Yosemite National Park. And <coughs> how can we, uh, this is a global phenomenon. So the solution should also be global. Solutions that are uh, discovered in uh, Europe and America should be used in Asia, and likewise in reverse. And I want to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing uh, in the process we call super torrefaction at uh, National Tsinghua University, NTHU. And this was a uh, picture in the middle is uh, uh, our first successful batch, and uh, actually the uh, members of the press, both from Chinese-speaking countries and uh, English-speaking, were there, some of them. And some of you may recognize the person uh, to the right. Okay, He is actually uh, Eugene Wang, who was a vice president at Hong Kong UST. So even a Hong Kong representative was <laughs> at this, and we were very happy. And finally, uh, <coughs> where it comes to uh, molten salt and, uh, and uh, uh, graphite, carbon technology, comes together in this uh, picture here, which uh, shows a piece of nuclear-grade graphite sitting in uh, fluoride salt that's at 900 uh, Celsius. And it's so hot that uh, <coughs> it's uh, right? It's uh, radiating in infrared and uh, uh, <coughs> near-red uh, wavelengths, so you can see it glowing. But it's not on fire, OK? It's not on fire. It's uh, just heated, and it's not being corroded. So that's uh, <coughs> an amazing aspect of uh, some of what I'll talk about. Anyway, this is a large group of people that's involved. Uh, uh, you can see these names, some are astrophysicists. They involve people from Hong Kong, like Professor C.T. Liu, crucial member uh, of uh, working on this problem. Some of you may know. Yang Zhu Bao, uh, Ralph Yang, Yang Zhu Yu, the brother, younger brother of uh, Ralph, uh, of Henry Yang, chancellor at UC San Diego, uh, and uh, other people, all right, uh, from uh, industry, from uh, <coughs> Tsinghua University, from ITRI, from Zhongshan uh, Kershaw uh, Yuan, uh, CSIST, uh, et cetera. Anyway, our inspiration comes from the past, OK, that climate change is reversible. That's the hope that uh, I hope to transmit to the young people here. Often you hear, we've passed the point of no return. It'll be a 1,000 years before we get the climate that you know, I experienced as a youngster. I hope to convince you today that's not true. We can actually reverse climate change on a time scale of about 25 to 100 years. And this <coughs> hope the future comes from something from the past, which is this black soil that is uh, made by humans uh, in the Amazon basin and was created you know, between uh, 2,500 years ago to uh, uh, about 1,000 years ago, <coughs> where through slash and burn agriculture, carbon, fixed carbon, got buried beneath the ground, more or less in the form of charcoal. And that has many beneficial aspects to sandy soils. These are poor soils. The water easily runs away. Not much organic uh, matter. <coughs> so you know, when you grow crops, it doesn't have much. 
But when you put carbon into the ground, which is kind of the reverse of digging up coal from the ground and burning it, you put it back into the ground. You not only sequester carbon in a fixed form below the ground, but you increase the crop yield above the ground, and that's doubly carbon negative. Okay. So, <clears throat> so let me give you the outline of the talk. Uh, first, I'll focus on replacing fossil fuels with sin fuels. By sin fuels, I mean fuels made from biomass using high temperature chemistry. Okay, not biologically, which is too slow, but just the biological end, of course, is the plants themselves, but using high temperature chemistry <coughs> and uh, uh, other means. So we'll talk about this process that we call super torrefaction, where we can make biomass into sin fuel in 10 minutes. All right? And oxidizing a way to burn, for example, one of the products, which is charcoal, in a way similar to one burns coal, but in such a manner, under molten salt, such that you don't produce fly ash. People may know burning coal is bad because of the gaseous emissions, but it's also bad because of the particulate emissions. The reason why Beijing is you know, so polluted is because of the particulate emission. Here you can do it without fly ash. <coughs> and then reversing climate change uh, by what I've already talked about. Something that is longer term <coughs> is turning seawater into fuel. If you have a wish in Taiwan or in Hong Kong, what would you most like to use given the resources you have? Well, you don't have many resources, but you're surrounded by the ocean. Is there a way that we can turn seawater into fuel? That's a holy grail in some sense of much of what people talk about. And there's a way to use energy such that you can capture and sequester it, which is called bioenergy carbon capture and sequester. So even that becomes carbon negative. Okay? I'll talk about bridge from fossil fuels to thin fuels and then some take-home messages. <coughs>